Welcome back to the MHT Podcast. I am Patrick Martin, your host, here to teach you mental health hacks for improving your thoughts, your emotions, and behavior so you can do more than just cope, but thrive. We'll be continuing our series on fundamental coping skills for depression, and the subject material I have repurposed that this derived from is the works from Dr. Jean Miranda and her cohorts in Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for depression, specifically for group models. Um, But these skills are multifaceted and applicable, and you know me, I like uh, actionable information. So that's why I'm bringing this to you. I think this is uh, the foundation of what CBT is and how it applies to our lives. So that's why I'm taking the time to kind of lay this out for you over a 12-episode series, and today we're in episode 9. But before we jump in, I do just want to check in with you, kind of let you know what's been going on in my world this week. Um, We are now entering the third week of the stay-at-home order in light of COVID-19, and like I've been discussing with a lot of my clients, it's really important to try and use this mandated time as a protected time to focus on those things that we would normally put on the back burner in terms of projects, personal development, um, things that we never, quote, have time for during the hustle and bustle of our regular day lives. And um, it's a great time to reflect, you know, and think about what we would like to focus our intention and attention on. And uh, for me this week, you know, it's been small things like uh, fixing the curtain in my bedroom. The cord broke like three months ago and it's been on my to-do list just kind of floating there. And if I've, you know, you ever heard me talk about my to-do lists, that's kind of like a a floating list. I use Google Keep Notes and so I'll lay them out, you know, on my tasks and then I just kind of slide them around in order of priority. And that's one thing that's always kind of been pushed to the bottom, but I was able to get to that yesterday. So that was great. Got that done. Been spending a lot of time with our kids, crafting, playing. So a lot of family time, more time outside, backyard, you know. So it's been nice in that uh, that respect. Okay. So I do encourage you, you know, try and use this time to just assess and collect your, your thoughts and focus on what is meaningful for you. All right. Hope you're all doing well out there. Um. And as always, if you find this uh, podcast helpful, the information applicable, please do share it with your friends, family. Um, There's a lot of work to be done in mental health awareness, and there's still a lot of ambiguity around what mental health is and treatment and therapy and coping skills. And there's been a lot of work done. And I think with the whole COVID-19 thing going on right now, it's bringing a lot of light to telehealth and accessibility and how to get help and go about that so and in a lot of ways that's good you know one good thing that's come out of the situation but there's still a lot of work to be done so please do share um, as you see appropriate and on the same token I um, also would like your feedback in terms of content you would like to see me put out uh, as I explore adding to my YouTube channel. Right now, it's just the podcasts that I'm kind of repurposing up there, but um, I have every intention of creating some tutorials, walkthroughs, uh, as you know, videos, and then eventually courses. So if there is anything you would like me to speak to directly, just as with my blog and podcasts, but on a visual basis in terms of walkthroughs or um, lectures or anything like that, please do let me know via the contact form in the um, description here for the episode, and uh, that'll take you to my contact me page. You can just leave me a comment there if you have any thoughts on the matter. Okay, all right, so thank you so much. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Mental Health Toolbox Podcast, where you will gain the knowledge to thrive. Here is your host, licensed psychotherapist, Patrick Martin. Okay, so today we'll be talking about depression and how to cope with it in light of relationships, and more importantly, how to leverage our uh, interpersonal relationships to help battle depression and actually move to a better place, and how we view ourselves and the world around us. 
Okay, so in this episode, I will be covering a few different things, first of which is the important role that relationships play in actually managing our mood, specifically depression, and also how to build a healthy support system. A lot of people in depression, they don't know um, where to start, because oftentimes recovery means ending unhealthy relationships, and sometimes you're not left with much to uh, dive off of, to work with. So we'll be talking about how do you build a healthy support system if you do not already have one, um, if you're not fortunate enough to. And then we'll also talk about how to build on your existing support system. So if you do have a support system, but maybe it's got some wiggle room to improve, you know, the relationships definitely will talk about how to be intentional about that. And also, uh, lastly, skills for managing depression in relationships and preventing further loss. Because, as we know, people with trauma, mental health symptoms, disorders, you know, there's a lot of loss that surrounds um, the fallout with those things. So we'll be talking about how to do some damage control, okay? So th this is episode nine. And we are starting off what I consider to be the third pillar of these fundamental skills. The first of which was our thought patterns, our thought process. How do we get into the habit of catching those thoughts and then addressing them to see if they are factual? And if not, what we do with that? And how do we come to a better conclusion? And the second pillar was about how to dictate our behavior in spite of our moods to improve the deviation of our moods, right? So we get into the habit, we build the muscle of action before emotion, that we do what we want to do, whether we feel like it or not, but because we know it's good for us. So we talked a lot about that and um, what some of the barriers were with managing our behavior and healthy activities. And now in the third pillar, we are addressing relationships, which is usually saved for last when we're coming at it from this kind of three-pronged approach because relationships are the trickiest because while we might have con you know, the most control over our thoughts and our behavior, what we cannot control is other people, right? So that's why it's a little more tricky and multifaceted. So we'll get into that. And so I would like to start off by just reflecting on why relationships are so important to begin with, okay? Which might, I mean, on the front end, it might sound like common sense, but let's just stop and think about why, okay? Why nobody's really an island. We're not built for that, okay? Social interactions, the interactions we have with one another, they have a certain potential to, to like, a, to produce positive outcomes, like an in, inherent kind of a potential energy, and the way that we interpret our environment is oftentimes directly correlated with the company we keep. And our sense of self, right, you think about your ego, your self-esteem, you know, I, I frame it as self-concept, you know, how we frame a view of ourself. And the relation to the world around us, right, I, th I think of that as self in context, right? The way we view the world is the context, but... There's this kind of internal view of ourselves. That's our self-concept or self-esteem. And our prospects for the future, how we think about the potential for change, often stems from these two things, our self-concept and our self-context, which stem, of course, from the types of relationships and lived experiences that we have. So our interactions with others allow us for a shared experience of the human condition which in and of itself has a comforting impact. Think about what's going on right now with COVID-19. And talking with a lot of my clients who have been isolating, not because it's a mandate, but because they're depressed, you know, a lot of them actually find comfort in the fact the whole world is in isolation right now because that relatability, that, oh, you know, I'm not the only one now that's stuck in my house. Everybody's kind of living my life right now and my challenge, what I've been living with for a long time. And there's a comfort in that, right? That all in the same boat mentality. And let's talk about depression and why it's a problem for a second. See, a core problem with depression 
is that the compensatory behavior that we are inclined to exhibit in effort to alleviate our negative emotions, it moves us farther away from healthy interactions with others, not closer. And by compensatory behavior, I mean that that behavior that is kind of the negative coping, that avoidance of pain, right? That's why people isolate is because it's an avoidance, right? If somebody's agoraphobic from anxiety, they're avoiding the pain and fear of the unknown, of the bad thing, the sense of dread they, they feel when they leave the house. And so isolation is that compensatory behavior. If we're afraid of conflict in relationships or feeling judged or misunderstood um, with depression or low self-esteem, the compensatory behavior then is to not get, let anyone get too close, right? And these behaviors are usually rooted in the harmful thinking habits that we discussed in the earlier episodes. And these behaviors include things like social isolation, social avoidance, excessive sleeping or hypersomnia, lack of interest or passion in activities or socialization, anhedonia, right, is a clinical term for that, withdrawing, becoming easily irritable and less responsive to other people's attempts to engage us and pull us out of our shell. These behaviors associated with depression lead to negative unhelpful moods such as anger, sadness, loneliness, fear, shame, and guilt. And these emotions in turn feed back into the kind of isolative behaviors that prevent us from engaging in healthy relationships. It is kind of it's what we refer to as a negative feedback loop, and it's my hope that through learning these skills you find a way for what's called second order change. It's that thing that breaks this feedback loop. It's how we start a new trajectory in our life. All right, so let's jump into the first skill I would like to discuss with you in this episode, and that is chaining. Now, yes, if you've been listening to the episodes on this podcast, you've heard the term chaining before, and we are going to apply the same principle um, that we did with our thoughts and our activities or behavior, right, in those discussions. And while the same concept can be applied to managing depression in relationships, we specifically have to focus on the correlated behavior, right, that's going to move our mood in one direction or the other, so that we are doing things on purpose, for a purpose, and matching our intention with our actions. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that. And we still start with a neutral event, right? So if we go back to that scale, right, 9 being the best mood, 1 being the worst mood, on a scale of 1 to 9, we would put that neutral event at a 5. So if you just think about this in a kind of a a linear fashion, and imagine with me if you would, that each number on that scale of 1 to 9 has a correlating behavior. And if you need a visual of this, you can just jump over to the show notes and you'll see that on the blog um, where I have that typed up. Okay, but so nine being the best mood, one being the worst mood, we're going to take a neutral event and let's just call it a breakup. Okay, so the breakup is a neutral thing, right? It has no intrinsic value in itself. It's only the value we attribute to the, the situation that's impacting us. Okay. And if we start with a five being the breakup, then the behavior that proceeds, our response, will either move our mood up in a way of improvement or down in a way of decreasing uh, satisfaction, right? That spiral we talked about. And the good news is we get to choose how our behavior plays out, how we respond to things. And the, the trick here is that quicker we are at intervening in our own thoughts and behavior, the, m- the more directly we can actually influence our mood in spite of the circumstances. So, for example, if the event is a breakup, we can improve our mood incrementally by first choosing to call a friend to vent, right? What might help a little bit more might be asking feedback from a friend about how they view our role in that breakup, right? Getting perspective from somebody else, from a sounding board that we trust. Honest advice, uh, honest feedback. 
something that bring, might bring our mood up even a little bit more would be, for example, sending a private message, letter, text, or phone call to the ex, owning our own behavior in the breakup. And this creates a sense of objectivity that we can see our own behavior outside of ourselves, and which is really good for depression. And also, um, what might bring us to a nine, like the best mood potentially, might look something like making plans with a friend to distract from the loss and build on existing relationships, right? So that's, that's that relationship piece where we're leveraging our friendships, but we're also then turning our attention to the other healthy relationships as a way to mitigate the fallout from that event. When we think about life domains and relationships, this is why it's important to have you know, things going on in each domain so that when one domain takes a hit, like if you lose your job, then you have a good support system to fall back on or you have a good spiritual advisor to talk to, or, you know, that kind of thing. So there's, you can kind of compensate for the loss in other areas while you heal, right? But if you put all your eggs in one basket or one person, then when things impact that relationship or that job or whatever we put all of our stock into, there's nothing, there's no safety net. There's no, there's nowhere to transfer that energy to, okay? Now, if we looked at this in a negative spiral, right, let's say you, somebody breaks up with you, your mood might go down if your behavior looked uh, like a trend in the following way, right? Let's say you send a mean post on social media, kind of blasting that person or putting them down or directly outing them, right, on social media. It might feel good initially, but it, it's going to hurt your mood in the long run. Then let's say you might start ignoring your friends who try to reach out to you. Telephone calls, text messages, right? You stop answering your phone. Next, you know, you start picking arguments with your family and friends, picking fights, right? Trying to sublimate for your negative emotions, taking out, you know, projecting on other people. And, you know, at the worst mood, it might look like isolating and canceling plans with everyone that you had made. So you can see it's kind of the exact opposite trend of what would help your mood, right? You, you know, the more you isolate, the worse your mood's going to get. The more you reach out and distract with positive activities, the better your mood's going to get. So that's chaining, right? And we can apply this to any circumstance. And really the, the takeaway with that is to try and view events as neutral until we assign a value to it. And even if it's difficult to separate our emotions from the event, we still have a choice in our behavior and how we respond. And it's not like you go from a 5 to a 9. It's these incremental choices that lead to a better mood, that lead to more support. Okay, and then that leads us to the next point, which is our support system. And when I think about support systems, I think of four general categories that supportive others kind of fall into, all right? And this goes back to the domains I was kind of referring to. So the four domains of supports are, I think of as practical or logical people, advisors, steadfast people, and then intimate supports. And these are just recommendations. You can make up whatever labels you want um, as long as they make sense to you. But when you think about your support system, it is helpful to map it out in a way that allows you to clearly see from a bird's eye view how balanced it is across these various types of domains. It's a give and take, right? And each of the categories that I mentioned, there should be people that you get support from and also those that you offer support to. No relationship is always going to be even or equal in this regard. And even within the same relationship, the current relationships will flow and alternate in either direction depending on the circumstances, right? Because you go through stuff, they go th through stuff, and you can be there for different ways at different times, right? For each other. That's the whole purpose of a relationship, right? Is to build each other up, not tear each other down. And so to me, the best way to seek balance then is to try and make certain that you are both giving and receiving 
in different capacities across these domains. I think that's one of the things that has made 12 steps so powerful is that it follows that model, right? You have the sponsor who's mentoring you, but then when you reach a certain point, you're, in, well, even from the beginning, you're being of service, right? They give you certain jobs, um, responsibilities, and then as you progress, you take on bigger responsibilities eventually, and like maybe you're sponsoring somebody else. So it's this hand up, hand down kind of thing. Okay, so next, you know, I'd like to think about cutting loose, unreliable supports. It might sound harsh, but sometimes that is necessary because we only have so much time and energy to invest in different people and goals in our lives. And we have to think about what is the most advantageous, not not in the terms of being a fair weather friend, but if somebody's causing you to relapse, for example, and you, you, you don't see much wiggle room for this pattern changing, sometimes you have to distance yourself and set boundaries from people who are not allowing you to be your best self. And if a particular support person has been inconsistent at best and continues to disrupt your flow when seeking help, then it's okay to invest your time somewhere else. You know, opportunity cost is a real issue here. And, you know, people who are pulling you down cannot really be tolerated if you're going to learn to be effective in managing your depression in relationships. It's like, uh, think about crabs in a pot, right? When you're boiling crabs, you know, a crab can climb out of the pot. But what prevents it from climbing out is other crabs pulling it back down. And so sometimes we have to be cognizant of the type of supports that we have so they're not working against each other. And uh, some helpful tips for nurturing your support system. Communicate your needs clearly and concisely, right? Identify the best match between your identified problem and your supportive domains and the supports within that domain. We often default to the most convenient support, right? Whatever is in proximity to us tends to be the, whoever is in proximity tends to be the person that we gravitate toward for support, but they may not be the most appropriate in the circumstances, right? If you need financial advice, you don't necessarily go to your pastor. But if you're used to going to your pastor, right, because that's who you talk to, you might get some decent advice, but it may not be the most advantageous advice for you, given the circumstances. If you have a CPA in your support system that you just weren't thinking about because they maybe weren't the most convenient person to access at the moment. Make sense? Okay. So in order to kind of practice this skill, it's helpful to draw out a diagram of four squares and then you kind of divide it so you have each square representing a domain so you draw a line down the middle of each and then on one side you list people that you get the most support from and on the other side you list the people that you offer support to in each domain so you have this grid of four squares and then you half those squares and that'll give you kind of visual representation of where you have some work to do right or some options at least and then I want you to reflect, you know, in which domains do you have the most support? That's good to know. And in which domains are you lacking the most support, you know, in? And that'll give you some guidance and give you some work to do in terms of how do you get more support in this area. All right. And then, you know, for example, even, you know, it's not set in stone. And if you're not spiritual, then a spiritual domain may not be like a pastor or something like that. But you might be into yoga and nature, right? and mindfulness and meditation. And so then you would look for uh, role models in that sense. People who inspire you. All right. So this brings us on to the next topic. How to make new supports. And in working with my clients, one of the biggest complaints I hear is the challenge with making new friends in light of depression. You see, by the time that most people start seeking help for their, de their depression, they have usually lost or forfeited a lot of their support system to either their anxiety or depression, and it's very hard to start from scratch. 
For most of us, our support system develops organically, over a long period of time, sustained by our routines and other meaningful activities such as work, school, religion, and so forth. For the isolated or timid individual, the idea of going outside of their comfort zone and forcing social interaction is terrifying. It's terrifying for people who aren't even timid, oftentimes. The idea of putting yourself out there and taking social risks, I mean, that's a big ask, right? And I understand that. So a good starting place, then, is generally a place where you're making healthy supports in a neutral, organic condition. By this, I mean one ought to set out to engage in an activity that they are already familiar with and have an affinity towards, right? A natural passion or talent around. We discussed this a little bit in an earlier episode in uh, the behavior, the episodes on behavior modification. Um, However, now we're specifically looking at how to seek out meaningful activities in the company and engagement of others. Whereas before we were talking about more like isolated activities or not necessarily socially based activities, but you know, if you like to go running, go run. But now we're talking about scheduling activities into your your schedule and your routine that specifically involve other people. And this is especially helpful because even if you do not end up making any connections in that activity, then you at least are doing something that you already enjoy, right? If you enjoy cycling, then, and I've done this a lot actually in sessions, I'll refer clients to like meetup.com and I'll have them look up a cycling group in the community or a hiking group or a walking group. And even if they feel like they don't want to talk to anyone, that's cool. I mean, you can't really talk to me about any cycling anyway. <laughs> you know, you're just um, doing your thing, but with a group of people and then there's the potential for interaction. So if you should choose, but there's not any inherent pressure to socialize. And then you did something you like. So so win-win. So I would encourage you to find existing platforms. And when it comes to mental health, technology can certainly be a two-edged sword. I understand that. Um, social media can be a pitfall that triggers low moods and harmful thoughts with that whole comparative thinking, right? But there are a plethora of helpful platforms for soliciting support and planning activities. And some of the most common ones that I defer and refer to when assisting clients with social engagement and building supports are the following. Meetup.com. It's an interest-based site. You've probably heard of it. No, it's not a dating site. (laughs) It is um, a social interest site. So if you like, again, cycling, you can find cycling groups or art groups or book clubs or hiking or art or whatever it is you're into. There's a group for that. And if there's not, you actually can create your own group. So that's cool. I know right now with COVID-19 going on, that's not happening. There are online groups, but as we get ready to press play, when the dust settles on this whole thing, you know what the plan is. And you could even invest time now into looking at meetup.com and start looking at the calendars of these groups and seeing what they're about and start selecting ones that you would like to follow up with when this whole thing settles. Another resource is wikidoo.com. Wikidoo, like Wikipedia, W-I-K-I-D-O, is a great site for um, finding events. So you can do it by interest, but these events don't necessarily mean they're social, but you, it's just by interest. So you can just punch in there like for the next 30 days and look at all events and it'll pull from all over the internet and shows you what's going on in the area. So that's a great way to start priming your mind for your your opportunities. If you're an outdoorsy person, alltrails.com is a great site to explore different types of trails. There's all kinds of ratings and pictures and difficulty levels and just wonderful information. If you're looking for a way to start getting back outside, hiking, walking, so forth, bicycling, you know, mountain biking, alltrails.com. And lastly, there's, um, volunteermatch.org. Volunteer Match is a website I, I, I defer to when clients are trying to find something that's meaningful to be of service, 
that without the commitment of necessarily employment or religious affiliation, but they just want something where they have short-term commitments and a way to give back. And it's a great way to kind of test the waters. Even if you're, for example, you lost your job because of depression or anxiety and you're scared to jump right back in, um, volunteering is a great way to build up that tolerance again of being out of the house and busy and on a schedule and doing work-like activities. Or just giving back, like we said before, being of service, right? If you feel like you don't have enough going on where you're being of service, that's a great way to kind of explore, or at least put yourself out there. And you can actually, if you go to the website, when you fill it out, you can list the types of activities that you're open to, even if it's just shopping for a senior citizen, right? Or providing transportation or just going for a walk with a senior citizen. I mean, there's just so many things, feeding the homeless, right, and so on and so forth. But volunteermatch.com. All right, so keep in mind that the relationships develop slowly and require repeated interactions over a long period of time to grow. When we look at other people, and you might be walking down the street, and you, you look around, and you might think, wow, everybody else has it together, why can't I be like that? Why can't I just make friends, you know? And the problem with comparative thinking is we only see the surface. We don't see the the background. We don't see all of the history and the trials and tribulations that developed around those relationships. And so um, be careful, you know, stay out of your head in that regard and just understand and take my word for it that relationships take time and repeated interactions, Right. People who spend time with somebody else, you know, begin to feel safe with that person. Uh, Familiarity breeds safety. And so that's why the repeated interactions are so important, because people are not going to open up until they feel safe. And in order to feel safe, they have to clock enough hours with you and at least enough repeated interactions, even if they're micro interactions, you know, sitting next to the same person at Starbucks enough times that the other person feels compelled to strike up a conversation, right? But it might take 30 times, you know, of seeing you before they even acknowledge you publicly. So keep that in mind. And if you're eager to build supports or anxious, it can become easy to make some common mistakes, right? Such as oversharing. I know that's really a big issue in people with substance abuse recovery. They feel like They have to share everything and put it all out there at once, right? There's that, um, that, uh, felt need in order to be accepted. I think it's to avoid judgment, right? Uh, there's a tendency to burn supports out and expecting too much in return or taking things too personally, right? At the moment you interpret something as uh, a personal attack or a judgment, you might shut down the relationship. When if you step back, you know, and you do some investigating, you might find out it wasn't even intended that way, right? Um, And a lot of the pitfalls I just mentioned, oversharing is usually the most troublesome. Like I said, especially if you have a history of substance abuse. There is a tendency to kind of get it all out there or try to connect quickly with others through self-disclosure. But the problem with this generally, is that others will not reciprocate at the level that you are trying to self-disclose, and they will likely become more guarded, not more open, if you expect too much in return too soon, right? It sends off red flags to other people, plus they just, if they can't match your pace, they're going to back off. Um, So also sharing everything or too much too soon, it can place you in a kind of vulnerable position because now the other person knows more about you than you do about them which can lead to a power differential in the blooming relationships and this can create a kind of undesirable social dynamic that becomes uh, normal but also solidifies skewed boundaries okay and what's expected or the social norms if you would okay And lastly, I would like to talk to you about pacing your interactions. Start slow. 
start with neutral environments with time limits, such as meeting at a cafe or a bookstore, and be sure to arrange your own transportation and do not rely on others to make it happen. As best you can, anticipate triggers and mitigate possible stressors. Okay, I can't tell you how many times in working with clients, I hear them angry and resentful. And they're angry because they feel like somebody else slighted them, but it was really displaced expectations. And so we want to make sure that we are mitigating as many contingencies on other people as possible in order for us to hit our goals or social interactions, right? <clears throat> that's why I bring up things like transportation because that's a that's a common one. You know, somebody doesn't show up when they say they're going to show up or aren't comfortable giving you a ride home, then it's easy to start harboring resentment. Okay, the next interaction could be a little more formal once you get to know someone, such as going out to eat. It may be best to start with breakfast and work towards something like dinner. Um, or a movie, or a show. And once you become better acquainted, you may start to consider consider ride sharing, but not initially. We're talking about way after the relationship has a firm foundation. Okay. If you're struggling with coming up with ideas for possible activities, brainstorm activities of interest that are in line with your values and build on that. Possible suggestions are things like sporting events, playing sports, hiking, walking, book clubs, church, volunteer groups, nonprofits, free city events such as art walks and concerts in the park, cultural events and locations like museums and botanical gardens. All right. Okay. So hopefully these principles were helpful. Um, we'll continue with a uh, discussion around relationships for the next few episodes before we move on to something else. Um, but we are at the tail end of the fundamental coping skills for depression. And um, I just really think it's important to relay those to the public because I think there's an, a lack of knowledge around these things and life application anyway. All right, so key points in summary of what we discussed in this episode. Healthy social exchanges improve your mood. You have a choice in how your support system is structured and the level of engagement for various supports. Right, you get to choose the intensity. You can build a customized support system tailored to your needs and preferences and interests. Support systems are comprised of both giving and receiving, so being of service. You can get better support by matching the appropriate support to your current needs. And it is possible to become more efficient at managing depression in relationships. All right. And you can put these skills to practice in a few simple ways. First, evaluate your current support system and identify ways that you can improve upon it. Then you could look at how you can add people to your support system to bolster it in the domains that are lacking. And you can commit to an enjoyable activity that you can engage in this week that involves other people. All right. And uh, in the next episode, I'll be discussing pitfalls that aggravate depression and how to mitigate them with respect to relationships. Okay. Um, hopefully you found this helpful. Again, if you did, please do feel free to share it with others. And, um, pay it forward. Uh, if you find yourself in crisis at any time, please do use the crisis hotlines. Uh, the Suicide National Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255, or you can text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 741-741. Okay, and if you're ever in need of mental health referrals, you can just uh, give NAMI a call, and they can guide you in the right direction. Um, as always, I am a licensed therapist, but I'm not your therapist. If you need professional help, you know, you can find it, uh, psychologytoday.com, therapist finder, or other resources, or your local clinics. 
Um, I'm so honored to have you as a listener, and I wish you all the best. You take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Mental Health Toolbox Podcast. Learn more at www.thementalhealthtoolbox.com.